Welcome to Pro Practice, your guide to piano mastery. I'm Josh Wright, and today we have a very special guest, Dr. Stephen Buse. Dr. Buse is someone I have long admired and looked up to, and he will be teaching us about the prelude from English Suite Number no. 3 in G minor, BWV 808 by Johann Sebastian Bach. To properly introduce Stephen, I thought I would read a paragraph from his biography because the accolades are extensive. <laughs> Dr. Buse was born and raised on a farm in eastern Washington. He began piano lessons at age five and made his orchestral debut four years later. He holds degrees from Whitman College, the Juilliard School, and Stony Brook University. His teachers have included Leonard Richter, Robert McDonald, Gilbert Kalish, Christina Dahl, and Paulette Richards. He has recorded on Endeavor Records, Harmonia Mundi, and Centaur Record labels, and is a Steinway artist. In the space of four months, Stephen Buse won first prize in the Gina Bachauer International Piano Competition. And side note, I was at that final round where he won. He played the third Prokofiev Piano Concerto in the final round. It was absolutely stunning. I still remember that as a highlight performance that I've been able to um, witness. The Vendome Prize International Competition in Lisbon and was awarded the Max Allen Fellowship of the American Pianists Association in Indianapolis. That's also an extremely prestigious award. Uh, reviews have described Stephen as mesmerizing, explosive, intelligent, and have stated that he belongs on the world stage. I couldn't agree more, and I'm so excited to welcome Dr. Stephen Buse to Pro Practice. Hello, my name is Stephen Buse. I'm a pianist and a professor of piano at Brigham Young University, and I'm very happy to be sharing a few thoughts on Josh Wright's pro practice. I'm a big fan of Josh Wright's work and his artistry, and I watch his videos, so it's fun for me to be able to share a few of my own thoughts on his platform. Um, before I jump into this piece, which I'm very excited to talk about, um, there are a couple of big issues that I don't have time to cover, but I want to mention them and encourage you to do some of your own exploration. One of these topics, again, that's too big to cover in this, in this format, is the issue of instrumentation in Bach's keyboard music. Of course, Bach didn't have a Steinway like this, um, and it's important for us, I think, to know and to be familiar with the kinds of keyboard instruments that Bach had and how he treated them. Um, for example, I mean, the harpsichord, the clavichord, and the organ seem to me to be very different instruments. But for Bach, he would often play his pieces interchangeably on these different instruments. And I think we don't need to spend our lives trying to make this instrument sound like a harpsichord or like a clavichord. But I think we miss out on a lot if we don't have an understanding of the expressive capabilities of these instruments. So I would really encourage you to spend some time in getting to know harpsichord, clavichord, and organ, because generally speaking, Bach would have performed his keyboard works on any of these instruments. There are a few exceptions. I mean, the Goldberg variations. This this piece was written specifically for a two-manual harpsichord. And um, so there'd be one manual on top, one on the bottom, and the idea, I mean, some of the variations require two manuals. And it makes sense when you start having to do this. If you've ever tried to sight read the Goldberg variations on um, a piano, you'll soon realize that there are these kind of traffic jams that you get into because the piece was not written for a single manual um, instrument. But the Goldberg Variations is more of an exception to the rule. Most of Bach's music would have been uh, performed interchangeably on harpsichord, clavichord, organ, including the English suites. So instrumentation is a big topic that I would encourage you to, to spend some time um, researching. And there's amazing um, content on YouTube that can help with that. Um, a second topic that's really too big for this presentation, but that I encourage you to, to explore, is articulation. I mean, if you've looked at an Urtext edition of Bach's music, you'll notice that there aren't a lot of slurs or staccatos. Um, and then if you look at Beethoven or Chopin, you have more. 
Beethoven and Chopin, these later composers became much more specific about how they wanted their music performed. And in Bach's time, actually Bach wrote in more of these kinds of directions than other composers of his time, even though there's not very much. So, and it doesn't mean that Bach did not intend there to be a variety of articulations, like little slurs or staccatos. I mean, he absolutely expected the performer to add this kind of um, articulation to his mu to to the music, and it was a way that performers could personalize their own interpretation of a piece. So, this is this is a a, a big topic and one that's really worth exploring. One way you could start is to just gather a variety of uh, pieces, like an Urtext edition. Of, I mean, you get the, the English suites, the partitas, a well-tempered clavier. The Italian concerto is a great one to look at. And just go through and see when Bach actually writes in articulations. What do they look like? Are they long articulations? Do they go over bar lines generally? Do they tend to be over two or three notes? How long are they? Do they look different in a fast movement versus a slow movement? This is actually quite, I think, fascinating to look into. And this will give you, I think, confidence in how to add articulation to a piece that where Bach didn't give us a lot of a lot of um, direction. In addition, I mean, you can check out also like the string music. There's some wonderful articulation written in, you know, the, the string suites as well. Um, so articulation, it's a big it's a big topic, but I think it's one thing that really brings the music to life. It's a performance that can really capture the the articulation. And if you're going to play the rest of the suite, which I hope I hope you'll finish, you'll play the entire suite. When you take the repeats, another huge topic is ornamentation. What to do when you take the repeat? And there's a lot more to do than just um, play the second time quieter. There are a lot of expressive um, capabilities. So if you're playing the rest of the suite. Um, get interested in ornamentation. But again, these are topics that are a little too big for this particular kind of format. And um, the last thing I want to say before we jump in, and this I think is my number one piece of advice for the prelude of the third English suite, and that is to get familiar with uh, movements in concerto grosso form. Um, there are six English suites. They all have preludes, and five of these preludes are in concerto grosso form. And so concerto grosso, basically, I think of a stage with a large ensemble, like a, a string orchestra, and then in front, I think, maybe two violins or something. So we have this large ensemble, and then we have a small ensemble. And in concerto grosso form, we have a section with like the whole orchestra playing, and then we have a section with just the small ensemble playing. So basically louder or fuller, and then smaller. And then it goes back and forth between these different uh, forces. And um, so my recommendation is, is to spend time listening to like the Brandenburg concertos of Bach or listening to Vivaldi, you know, violin concertos. I think it is so instructive. And if you really get that sound in your ear, I think you will avoid a lot of the pitfalls that, that people sometimes fall into. So, I mean, like the third Brandenburg concerto... And I love watching videos of, of these ensembles playing, of videos of really, really good players. I love I love how the bow goes up, the bow goes down, and there's it's it's so um, there's so much motion in it. Often when I look at the keyboard and all of the keys go down and you have to go down, and I think one of the dangers is that we play too much down. We play too much. It, it sounds too percussive, and it feels one-dimensional. Whereas string players can find quite a lot of, you know, fire in their accents, in their down bows. They can have weight, but it never gets heavy. And those are things that we sometimes fall into on the keyboard, where our accents maybe become too percussive, or there's too much heaviness because we're not... You know, we don't play up bows and down bows, but I think if you can think up bows 
down bows, you know, what kind of, what kind of violin articulation. And I realized my 11 year old son who plays the violin would tell me, dad, you need to keep your scroll up. But anyway, I'm trying to speak into the microphone, but if you can really be inspired by, by how an up bow looks and a down bow, and there's small down bows and there are bigger down bows and just really be inspired by how uh, the string players bring this music to life. If you can really internalize that, I think when you approach, you know, this this concerto grosso movement, this prelude from the, the third English suite, I think you'll find a way to keep it buoyant and avoid percussive accents and keep it and keep it dancing. So I have a score here that I will share on the screen. And I know when I know Josh often doesn't use a score on his videos because we can't we can't include the good Urtext editions. We have to use only public domain editions, which are usually not the best edition. And this edition I'm using is not the best edition, um, but just for ease of talking about um, the different measures, um, I'm using the score. But I do not recommend this particular score. I recommend a good Urtext edition, but hopefully this can kind of help our discussion of what's going on. So looking at the very beginning of this piece, I think that the first challenge starts before we even play the first note. And that's because the piece begins with a rest. And I think if you're not careful, these first two notes, the first note will feel like a downbeat. It's really essential to feel the rest. I like to make those two, those first two notes quite short. And then the first downbeat, I like to make a little bit longer um, and just feeling kind of a fatter downbeat just to make sure that at least by the third note, people feel here is, here is our downbeat. Just like the second English suite prelude also. It can't be. And it helps me, I think, to feel some part of my body moving. Either I, I sort of beat my foot, just making sure that the first note doesn't sound like a downbeat. Whatever you do, make sure the first note does not sound like a downbeat. Um, and then as we continue, um, there's something so wonderful about this opening. It starts with a single voice, and then we have a second voice that's added, and then a third voice, and then another. Then we end up with this full chord, and this, I mean, on our piano, we still have a few octaves to go, but on box keyboard instruments, we're actually pretty, we're kind of going to almost the full range of his keyboard. So we're starting with a single, a single voice, and then we have this accumulation It's very exciting. And again, throughout this, we see these all of these eighth notes. And I, I again, I would imagine what would this what would the string ensemble and a concerto grosso on stage, what would it look like? Would what what notes would be up bow kind of going this way, which would be down bow with a little more emphasis, which would be a strong down bow, and which would be a small down bow. Um, again, if you play visually, they all look the same. They all look like eighth notes, and there are a lot of eighth notes, but it's essential that we don't treat them the same way at all. Think about the string players, how they move. Some notes are up, and then there's a feeling of um, just dancing, lots of dancing in this movement. So, so, I mean, add, add your bowings to this opening, which are up bows, which are down bows, what are you going to emphasize? And this, this opening is, is very, very exciting. But again, if you play, I wouldn't pay money to hear that. So uh, maybe add a little bit of, again, this articulation. One thing that I like to do, which 
you can do it differently, certainly. I liked, for variety's sake, sometimes a slur between uh, the downbeat and the second beat. And then the third, and this final one, I like them all short. Just so it's not always the same. We don't want the articulations to become predictable. But you might find other ways of adding articulation to, to bring life to it. So as we, as we continue into the eighth bar, in the eighth bar we have a, a circle of fifth sequence. If you kind of pay attention to the bass, we have a G, then a C, F. He's going up a fourth, down a fifth, up a fourth, down a fifth. And then in measure 22, we get out of the sequence and we start, we start doing something different. So one thing to think about as you're playing this long circle of fifths um, sequence is what you want to highlight. And actually, there's quite a lot to enjoy in this sequence. In the left hand, we have this, this scale down, but on the way down, there's a little bit of a of a bump when he changes directions and then continues. And I think about a cello. It's not. I think as pianists, it's possible we've played too many Hannon exercises. And there's kind of an emphasis on perfect uniformity. Um, maybe maybe it's positive to do those things, but I think it's also good to forget that sort of uniformity. What does a down bow feel like? What does it feel like when the cello has to, you know, cross the strings to play? Do you... So I would be interested in the left hand. Um, of course, the right hand maybe can be more prominent. And I would always think of, of gestures that go over bar lines. I, I often feel like between two downbeats, one downbeat will be stronger and the other will be weaker. So maybe starting in bar eight, we could think strong, weak, strong, weak. Or something. We want to avoid, I think, something that feels too square or too regular. Again, I think about how string players, really good string players, when they make music like this, it's just so dynamic and there's there's motion and there's... Um, I, it's just an inspiring thing to hear and I think the visual is also very instructive. So enjoy the right hand. Combine the measures in some way so it doesn't feel like one downbeat after another um, is sort of accented in the same way. It doesn't quite dance. And then one, one part that I particularly like, although it's tricky, is in measure 16, where in the right hand we have, for the first time, we have long held notes. And again, on the piano, we just sort of put them down and they're there. But a string player, I mean, it would sing. There'd be maybe some vibrato, but at least some bow speed. I don't know. Is this a down bow? Down, up. I don't, I, I don't know enough about bowing. But I like, I like the idea of some going more down, some going up, and there being a speed to the bow that just continues. And then the middle voice... Again, this is a place where we want to avoid the memories that we have, maybe bad memories of practicing Hannon. I don't think we want that. I imagine the first violin playing this and the second violin 
like standing next to the first violin and they're, they're, they're like speaking to each other. They're, they're communicating. So be interested in that. And of course, it's easier to do with two hands. But when you do it with one hand, this gets to be a little bit of a technical challenge, I think, because um, anytime we hold notes, I feel like our hand generally gets a little bit tighter. So if you can play, sometimes I even just practice the, the long note staccato. And this is sort of what it feels like. And then I hold it but I try to maintain that feeling of letting go. And then... And I'm kind of sitting unnaturally close to the piano so I can talk into the microphone. But um, if you can kind of feel the weightlessness of that B flat, So enjoy this beautiful duet between these two violins. Um, in the left hand, we have this, this beautiful rhythmic yum. And with the articulation, you could just, you could make them all staccato. For me, that feels maybe too one-dimensional. You could also play two note slurs at the beginning of every bar. That's already more interesting than making them all staccato. And with articulation, it's, there's not usually just one correct answer. There, there are multiple ways of doing it. So I might tell you my favorite way of doing it, but I don't want you to feel um, too pushed in one direction. Find, find a way that feels inspiring to you. But what, when I did this, I liked playing a two-note slur on the beginning of every second measure. So... coincides with when the soprano has an empty downbeat or at least a, a downbeat when they're not playing so for example I'm, I'm exaggerating but if you can see like in measures 18 when the right when the soprano has that a tied over then I bring out the left hand when it has the higher note and then two bars later again when the right hand has a tied note, I like to just kind of highlight the left hand um, downbeat. But then I noticed when I did that, um, I, I was neglecting my second violinist as I was highlighting the left hand. So probably the left hand, I would want more on a lower level and the middle voice may be more interesting. But I do feel like playing these these contrapuntal works of Bach. It's like babysitting three or four two-year-olds. It's like you can keep track of one or two of them, but usually there's another one who's creating mischief somewhere. And so it really is this challenge to keep to keep everything um, in its place. You know, the bass, you know, the the rhythm section, um, the middle voices, the soprano. It really it really is a challenge. So as you're practicing something like this, I mean, taking the voices apart hands separate, and then then thinking about how you want them all to come together. And again, there's always a danger that you get two of them really nice, and then the third one um, needs extra attention. And getting them all to sound nice at the same time is is a challenge. But, but it's, I think, an, an exciting challenge in this, in this music. So um, we finished this long circle of fifths section, and... I, I hesitate sometimes to point out patterns in music. Of course, we have to notice the patterns. But sometimes when we see a pattern in music, our brain goes into like autopilot. And it's like, oh, this is a pattern. And we stop thinking and we stop feeling and we stop dancing. So notice the pattern. Notice the circle of fifths pattern that, that goes on. But be interested in the ins and outs and how, how he makes it not boring. 
you know, because it, it really is not boring. There's a lot going on. Okay, let's continue to the next section.